Uh, hi, uh, tonight we have uh, Dave Waits, who's going to tell us about problems in soft matter and biophysics. Dave. Okay, so um, I don't think I'll be talking too much about uh, microfluidics. Uh, I just chose other things to talk about today. Uh, we do microfluidics, we do a lot of other things. Um, but I wanted to choose something that, um, in my mind, highlights uh, the richness of the field. Um, tells you or shows you some of the things that we do both to understand interesting problems or problems I find interesting, um, uh, develop new techniques to study them, um, but also um, lets us do um, really interesting problems in biophysics by applying what we learn from soft matter physics. And that has really the potential for um, important commercial um, or societal benefits. Um, so let me show you, I'll, I'll try to um, uh, give you a bigger picture of what we're doing, but please don't hesitate, just uh, unmute and ask questions if you don't understand something. I don't mind at all, I like it, so just go ahead. Um, so the first thing uh, I'm gonna show you is we develop new techniques. We like to always find new ways of studying things. And um, this is, um, a technique that was developed by a postdoc a couple of years ago. And he was asking some very simple questions. He says, what if I'd like to see this ladybug that he's looking with his uh, magnifying glass and I wanna watch the ladybug move. And if you're close to the ladybug, you can see the ladybug move very well. It just moves on the leaf back and forth. But as you step back from the ladybug and go far away, like if you were a mile away, you would never be able to resolve the motion of the bug moving back and forth. And the issue is really that um, when we make measurements of motion, we typically like to image an object and see how, how much it moves. You can see what we're doing here. We're imaging this, um, see if I can get my little pointer to work. Uh, laser pointer, yeah, we're imaging this um, ladybug and we can see it move, but if it's far away, we can't see the ladybug. So there's a, um, a, a connection between sensitivity and resolution. And he asked, can we break that somehow? And the way you can do that is you can take, an, take advantage of uh, certain features of light. So if I have two particles and each of them are scattering light, they're scattering a wave, but if one particle moves with respect to the other, then the phase of the waves change. And if you were to measure the intensity, you'd see a fluctuating intensity. And that intensity fluctuates when the particle or one, one scatterer moves a fraction of a wavelength of light. So this is moving a few hundred nanometers when it doesn't matter how far you are away. And so really what this is, is looking at uh, scattering from, um, um, objects, but trying to understand something about the features of the scattering. And I will not describe too much of the details, but here is um, a way you can understand a little bit of how we can do this. So if I imagine how light gets scattered, you know that if you ever take a laser pointer and shine at the wall and don't look at the bright spot, but look around the bright spot, you see these speckles of light. And that's what I'm showing here. I'm showing an image of scattering of light. This is, this is a microfluidic channel. And here, there are particles that are moving. And you can see that the, 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 the bright spots fluctuate in and out, fluctuate in and out. Here, things are not moving and things are stationary. And so what we do is we look at these speckles and we analyze the way they fluctuate in time. And physically, what's happening when a speckle goes from bright to dark all the particles inside the, the light that's being illuminated or the, the, the portion of the sample that's scattering, everything is moved with respect to one another by half a wavelength or a quarter of a wavelength. So we can see tiny, tiny motions, even if we're far away. And we developed this technique and we did a lot of work on it. And um, you can look at motion in both directions. You use two cameras. Uh, you can see that in one direction, things are fluctuating. That's because the particles are moving in this direction and they uh, cause the speckles to fluctuate. 
Here we're doing the same thing, but now we're looking at motion in this direction. There's very little motion, so the speckles don't fluctuate very much. A very powerful technique, and I won't go through the details, but um, uh, the postdoc who did this developed a way to make measurements of uh, strain fields, of tiny, tiny, tiny motions. So we were looking for some things to, to, um, to study uh, how we could do this. And one thing we, uh, we have interest in for a completely different reason, and I, I won't tell you, you know, I, I can tell you why it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's understanding the phase behavior of, of systems. And so we have something that can be a liquid and we can make it into a solid, we can make it gel, we can make it solid-like. And then to probe its properties, we try and break the gel. This could be one thing, that, one example of this is if you uh, imagine uh, paint, that's like a gel, it's solid particles with a fluid, and sometimes it cracks, and it cracks because it's drying and it's pulling itself apart. We do the same thing with these gels, they're much more esoteric, much more, uh, we, we understand them uh, in more detail, and we can probe them really simply, but we can either pass water through and you get this crack, or we can let it dry and get a crack. So here are the kinds of cracks that you get. And this is what it looks like if you look in a microscope. Here's one crack, and here's another crack, and both of them are moving. In this case, you can see that they're taking about an hour. It's because we're allowing the solvent to be dried out. But watch what happens when we do that. You see they move, and they move independently, and then this one starts to turn, and as soon as it hits the other one, it causes that one to turn. Why is that? What happened? Who says that should happen? How do we understand that? And what we really want to understand is, could we understand the motion on a very, very fine scale of all the material here and here and here? And can we understand something about what causes the cracks to change direction? And so what we did was we used that same scattering technique, which we call now holography, speckle holography. And from that, we can actually go and measure the actual motion of the gel, motion of the particle. So now I'm going to play a movie, and you're going to see here, and you can see the crack moving. You can see the speckles fluctuate, but we can also draw lines because we can actually measure the motion. We can measure the motion both in the x and the y direction. And here's just an image of the kind of motion that we measure. So we can go back now and look at this crack and measure how it moves. And we measure the whole strain field. So what we're actually doing uh Oh, <laughs> uh, Dave, you've frozen. Okay. Oh, I'm you're alive problem. again, sorry. Okay. Sorry, that's the Wi-Fi and Pierce. I oh, good old Pierce. Um, we yes. only lost about 10 seconds. So you're okay, so all I, all I said was, uh, I heard you when you said I was frozen. So I was hearing, hearing you guys. So what I'm saying is you can see these arrows and that's basically the strain field. As the material is cracking, it's pulling itself apart. And you can see these arrows represent maybe a few nanometers, a few tens of nanometers of motion of the field. And by looking at that, we can see the whole elastic properties of the whole network. And we can understand now when this one pulls here and this one pulls here, there's nothing or there's much less to pull in this direction. So the pulling in this direction is larger. And that's why the crack changes direction right when this one crack, uh, joins here. And we can understand the overall motion of the, of the fields. So this is an application that we that we can can uh, use. Um, there's a lot of really interesting physics and in understanding that. Um, I don't don't want to uh, uh, spend a lot of time uh, telling you that. I just wanted to show you an example because what I'd like to do is show you something that uh, we've uh, recently realized that we can do essentially the same thing for something completely different. And this is now for a biophysics problem. So. Uh, the biophysics problem is um, something that's recently been recognized in the behavior of cells. I mentioned it when you asked me some questions. Um, this is a schematic of what goes on in the cell. Uh, this is a cell. This is the nucleus. 
These are different regions where um, the ATP is made. Uh, these are membranes that are separating. The nucleus is separated by a membrane. These regions are separated by a membrane. Here's some other mitochondria. They're separated by a membrane. Basically, the cell is filled with these compartments that are surrounded by membranes. And that the reason for that is that you, if you have a one micron size compartment, even a single molecule is at a fairly high concentration. So just by reducing the volume, you can increase the concentration of small numbers of molecules. And that means that any kind of chemical reaction, like uh, creating uh, proteins, uh, uh, expressing DNA, uh, uh, translating uh, RNA to, to proteins, all of that will go um, much uh, in a much faster way because you're increasing the concentration, not by adding more molecules, but by decreasing the volume. What was found fairly recently is that in addition to uh, the membrane compartments, there often occurs um, other compartments where you get these aggregates form without a membrane. And they're aggregates of concentrated proteins, typically, maybe other things, uh, and they form in the cell and they're uh, formed because, not because they're surrounded by a membrane, but because they undergo some kind of phase transition. You get a phase transition where you have, uh, let me see if I can draw that, even. sorry. There we go. Uh, pen. So I have a, say some uh, constant, some something that's maybe a concentration of um, some crowding molecule and a concentration of the protein. And if I sit here, it will phase separate into two regions uh, joined by tie lines of a concentrated region and a low concentrated region. So this is the concentrated region and it's surrounded by proteins at a low concentration. We, as physicists, particularly as soft matter physicists, understand how to think about this very, very well. And we understand a lot about what's happening, what causes the phase transition, what the nature of the different phases are, how we can control that. We understand this in a way that looks at many bodies, it looks at many molecules. It doesn't look at the details of each molecule. We think of it more as a physics phenomenon than a biology phenomenon. This is studied by often by physicists, but also biologists, and the biologists will take a different pr perspective. It's not a bad perspective, but it's a different perspective. They'll worry about the details of the molecule-molecule interaction rather than the details of the phase behavior. I think we need to do both. So here's uh, an, it's another example. This is one. This is with amyloids, and why that's important is that that's what causes um, Alzheimer's. Uh, and ca it causes various types of diseases. So this is uh, something that occurs in cells and can be very disruptive. Here's just an example. These are uh, cells that are labeled with fluorescence. You can see the cells, uh, the purple is uh, the nucleus of the cells. The blue surrounding it is uh, one of the molecules that are, is in the rest of the cell. I think this, in this case, it's uh, the actin that forms a gel network in the cell. And I'm just gonna play a movie over, over about an hour. And you'll see that there are these drops, these liquid-like drops of proteins that form. And there are all kinds of interesting things. You know, if you disrupt the microtubules, the microtubules are like these big beams that provide mechanical support in the cell. If you disrupt them, you get a very different character of these uh, condensates. And this is basically phase uh, a phase separation of proteins forming these liquid droplets in the cell. And what we're interested in doing is understanding what the properties of, of, of these things are. What's interesting is that you don't have to do it in the cell. You can cause the phase separation of proteins by reconstituting the proteins just in a test tube or in a small sample cell, and you can look at the microscope and watch the way they behave. And this is just a movie looking at these condensates. So each of these is a condensate. And I can tell you right away that these are liquid because if you look in these circles, 
you'll see as the movie plays over and over, you'll see two condensates come and they join together. And the fact that they're liquid, the surface tension causes the uh, figure eight when they first join to form into a, a, a perfect sphere. And all these others are spheres and you can only have spherical shapes if you have a surface tension that causes the surface area to be minimized. So we know these are liquid, we can, uh, we can study their properties, but one thing that's very apparent is, well, oh, here's just, we're looking at, at two drops merge. Here's just a series of time images. Here's the two drops. They're coming closer, they've merged, and then they form a single drop. And this is over the course of about 20 seconds. And from that, we can learn, we can make an estimate. This is what the surface tension is. We can estimate the viscosity just by understanding the physics of this coalescence. We just have to understand the mechanics of the coalescence. It's just a simple problem. It's driven by the surface tension. It's, uh, it, it's resisted by the viscosity, and it's just a, a simple equation of motion to, to study this. Um, but sometimes they gel. So you can see that if you look carefully, this will play over and over again. If you look at these two drops, at first you see one that comes and then sticks, but now they just stick to one another. They don't actually merge. When it's merging, I've started the movie again. Here's another case where three of them have merged, have, have joined together and they stick together. If they stick together, they have to be solid-like. They cannot be fluid-like. If they're fluid-like, they would just merge. So somehow they're solid-like. So we're trying to develop tools to see whether we can study what's the nature of this. Again, we understand how to describe a solid-like material. If it's very soft, we know how to describe it. If it's a gel, we know how to describe it. We know its elastic properties. We know its loss properties, its effective viscosity. We understand that. Can we measure these things? Because if we can do this here, we should be able to do it in cells as well. So one thing we can do is just actually try to pick them up. So we do what's called micropipette aspiration. Basically, we take a pipette. This is a pipette whose diameter We've formed it. It's a very easy thing to do. You take a pipette and you heat it up and then you pull it until it breaks. It's, it's molten, it's, the glass is molten. So you can make it into a very, very thin diameter. In this case, it's about a 10 micron diameter. And we put a little suction pot here. We just suck the water out here. And if we do that, um, we see this. We see we can suck it and it just flows. It's like a liquid. If, however, we wait a while and it forms a gel, then on the other side, when we suck it, it doesn't go in. It just sticks there. It's a solid. It's clearly a solid. So we can clearly tell the difference when it's a liquid or a solid just by its response to when we pull on it. And it's like if you take something in your fingers, you can tell the difference between a liquid and a solid. We're not doing anything much different than that, except we're doing it on a much finer scale with a more precise uh, measurement. So that's one way we can measure it. But another way we can do is look at these speckles. And so we never expected to be able to do the same kind of speckle uh, technology that we did that I showed you before with these condensates, but it turns out you can. You can use a confocal microscope. A confocal microscope means that you can do, you can look not only image in, in, in two dimensions, but you actually can take a very thin slice. So this is a, uh, about a 30 micron sphere but we're just imaging a slice of that 30 microns. And you can see they're speckled. And now what, look what happens when I watch the time evolution of the speckles. You can see they fluctuate like mad. A few of them don't seem to change much in time, but most of them fluctuate like mad. But if we wait, here we waited about 10 days, eight days, and now we know the sample is becoming solid. And if we look at them, the speckles don't move, they don't fluctuate. They sort of stay stationary. Some of them fluctuate, but you can see if you sort of step back with your eyes, you can see sort of these networks of stationary speckles. So what we wanna do with this now is try to do exactly the same kind of measurements that we did with the gels, but now look and ask, is this a gel? What's the nature of the gel? Where is it a gel? How does it form a gel? Why is it a gel? What's caused it to be a gel? And if we can do it with these in vitro systems, we think, we haven't done it yet, but we think we can also do it in cells. And now why is that important? Well, I showed you one example of that. 
It's important because sometimes cells use these condensate, these phase separated regions, if they're subjected to stress, they use it to save some of their um, some of the resources, they save RNA, which will express into proteins, they save some proteins, they concentrate it in these, in these, um, in these uh, liquid drops, they're called stress granules, because when they overcome the stress, the, set, the material is then available to it. Other times, though, this starts to fail, and it becomes a gel, it becomes a solid, and that's really the uh, origin of, the, uh, of these plaques that form in um, neurons, which ultimately lead, uh, people think, to Alzheimer's. So that's a case where the fact that they're a gel versus being a solid is a very important um, um, difference. But you can't, there is no way of typically understanding this or measuring it in cells, uh, in, in real cells, in a very simple fashion. So we're sort of excited by this because we think that we might be actually, we might actually be able to go and look at these um, condensates and try to understand something about the nature of their solid-like behavior, their liquid-like behavior, and what causes that. Um, and as I think I mentioned, this, uh, the fact that you can form these uh, speckles, and I'll go back, or these, these uh, droplets, I'll go back here, the fact that these occur in cells uh, also is potentially the target of, uh, of a drug because these uh, uh, phase separated regions, they're observed everywhere. They're observed in the nucleus. When cells um, express proteins, uh, they have to create more RNA and you can see some of them. They're actually in the nucleus. They're creating more RNA. Uh, the proteins uh, form these droplets in the cells, uh, particularly under stress. Um, but people know how to use drugs to treat the nucleus, to treat the uh, proteins, but of course we can't treat all diseases. The question that we have is, could we actually use drugs just to disrupt or increase or decrease the presence of the condensates? And so we started a small company to actually try and do this. I mean, I, once you start getting doing drug development, that's not something I can do. It's involves too much, uh, too, too large a team, but it seemed like something that was really worth also trying to push out to try and really benefit our society, because if we could find new ways of drugging things, new ways of treating disease, that could have um, really a lot of potential, a lot of importance. So that tells you um, both my motivation from understanding the science by my, my motivation for trying to do something practical, um, and uh, I think I have one other slide. Yeah, if you want to learn more about it, uh, feel free to come visit us. We're on the fifth floor of McKay. Uh, a lot of soft matter physics schools on there. Um, and you're always welcome to come and talk to the people who actually do all the stuff. I don't, but students and the postdocs do. And they're always happy to talk to people here. And just... So let me stop there. And if you have more questions, let me know. Well, that, that's great. Thank, thanks so much. Um, a lot of questions. A good time. Turn your uh, <laughs> uh, turn your uh, sound on and uh, uh, answer the question. Guys, I know it wasn't that good. Cool. <laughs> well, Dave, let me ask, what's, uh, you know, the, these mRNA uh, vaccines work like uh, champions with HIV, they didn't work so well, and all of a sudden, you know, 90% plus. What do you think is the next uh, target for that? Do you have any idea? What... Yes, I mean, I think they will work for HIV. The problem is delivering the mRNA to the right place. The nice thing about the uh, vaccines is they just had to get it to any cells and then they, that would start an immune uh, response and the immune system could get to everyone. So it wasn't okay. so important to where it was delivered. It just had to get into cells. But for all the other diseases like HIV or any of the, these other things, I think the RNA is probably better understood. It's the delivery that's a real problem. You've got to get it to the to, to the cells that where the that that are infected by the, the HIV virus. 
So the luggage is what matters, the suitcases. Right, <laughs> exactly. So yeah. and again, that's a, you know, it's a, it's a good physics problem. It's really well, designing see. suitcases. And delivery. Let's see, Subin, you're being polite and raising your hand. Hello. Hello, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, thank you so much for giving the great seminar. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, for someone like me, who I have done a little bit of like chemistry research, but how, what would be the best way to start exploring bio in your mind as someone who's exploring other like biophysics and like a combination? Um, I think that um, you, you could study biology, but I would say that what would make any person who studied physics unique is to take a physics approach to biology. So I would uh, maintain, I would study physics, but I would do physics uh, that has an impact on biology. Um, and so certainly soft matter does, biophysics does, um, uh, physical chemistry often does. So I would just continue doing physics, but trying to work on questions that um, are, are biological in nature and in origin. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Uh, Christina? Um, yeah, so when you were showing that that video of sort of like sucking the drop back like into this tube, what yeah. was the like time delay between it behaving like a fluid versus more like a solid? Well, I mean, that's a good question. If we waited about uh, five days, it would turn into a, into a solid. But we also found that if we expose it to UV, we could uh, solidify it after about three minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you. You just have to firm, form some permanent bonds between the molecules. Uh, uh, you mentioned at one point, like how um, you were like looking to get into this like drug manufacturing sort of like idea with the company. Uh, and like, what does that look like if you you yourself are not like, you know, a, a drug manufacturer or like a like biological doctor? How does that process look like? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I, mean, I, I told you that I don't run the companies myself and that I don't do it in my lab. And the reason I don't do it in my lab is you need a big team to do that. So you need people who understand the drugs. You need people who understand the delivery. You need people who understand how to choose the drugs. You need people who understand the mechanisms. You just need a lot of people. So it takes quite a big team to do it. And uh, the, the challenge is to find the right people, the right team. But if you do, then it becomes very exciting. So you know, we started this company a little less than a year ago when we started with just a few people, but it's grown now to about 20 or 25 people because we've got people who understand drugs, who understand how to manufacture drugs, who understand how drugs work. So we just need many more people. And for me, I can just sit back and enjoy and watch it. I don't, I'm not an expert in this, but I'm happy to watch and learn from that. Uh, and I'll never become an expert, but I don't mind learning as much as I can. I find it very exciting. Good. Other questions? Uh, Dave, how do you raise the money? So you've got an idea and then I guess you're pretty well known, so they already like you, but no, no, <laughs> I beg, suppose, borrow, and steal. <laughs> but suppose if you have one of our uh, uh, crew here gets a good idea and then they want to uh, approach some VCs or somebody to uh, ah. uh, raise cash. What's the magic uh, recipe for that? Um, well, I, again, I think you have to learn how to present these things to uh, to VCs. We, I actually uh, teach us a course for science and engineers that tries to um, explain first, what it takes to start something, and secondly, give you some idea of what's required to do that. Um, and so you can do that, or you, there's all these places where uh, there are, uh, you know, a lot of organizations in Boston, in particular, that really will help you um, raise money. You know, even at Harvard, there's places, you know, there's, there's funds available for undergraduates, uh, to try and start companies. And then there'll be a lot of mentoring to do that. Um, so um, I always say, you know, it's, um, it's like this phrase for, for Nike, right? Just do it. Don't be afraid, just try it. <laughs>
you know, it doesn't matter. You'll learn, you make mistakes, but it's okay. Other, other questions? Yeah, if you have any desire to do that or any ideas, you know, I encourage you not to be afraid of them. Even it's, it's not what, at least when I was in, in university, it was not something that was sort of commonly done or acceptable, um, but I think it's getting more and more so. And I think it really is something that can be a lot of fun and very re rewarding as a career. Well, that sounds sounds great. A chance for one last question. If not, uh, thanks uh, so much, uh, Dave. Uh, it's really good stuff and interesting. It's great to hear what your most recent uh, projects are. All right, guys. Nice to talk to you all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.